go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining in this morning. morning. Really excited that you're taking time to be with us. Um, there's a lot of other things you probably could be doing, even sleeping in this morning. So thank you so much for joining in. We'll go ahead and get started with a short uh, trivia. It's a money trivia. There's no right or wrong answers. So uh, uh, we will get that displayed. It's just five short questions for you this morning. So we'll go ahead and get started. I want to open up, up with a word of prayer first, and we can have okay, we'll Mr. Mr. Johnson to, to uh, pray for us. Okay, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, Father in heaven, we bless you, Lord, and we thank you uh, for another uh, day. Father, we thank you for an opportunity uh, to come together, uh, uh, obviously not physically, God, but virtually. We thank you for the means that you've given us to do this. Father, we pray uh, for this class and um, all, all of those who are here and all those who wanted to be here. Father, we pray that the principles that we learn in terms of financial literacy, God, that we would uh, be good stewards of all that you've given us. I pray that, um, that the things that we learn, God, that we're able to take those things and to apply them uh, daily to our lives. Father, we thank you for uh, my mom, and we thank you for Deacon Moore and others who are helping to lead uh, this class. And Father, we uh, give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so there is the money quiz. Uh, and so there's just short, five short questions, and you can just write them down in, on a paper there at your home. And then I also give a couple other people time to join in, because sometimes it's, it can be a little challenging trying to get in Zoom sometimes. So I see a couple others have joined, so good morning. We're just going to be doing a short five-question quiz that should be on your screen right now. Somebody is texting me. So we got a couple other people that said it always. So give me just a moment. So hopefully they are joining in. I'm going to go back to one and two just in case someone missed them. I missed number five. I'm going to go back to the ball in a second. Just, just hang on. Oh, okay. Okay, how are you coming along? Everybody almost done? 
Hey, a quick point to everyone. I know some people don't like to show themselves on the screen and they put sheets of paper over the um, camera there. And of course, when that paper moves, it makes a loud noise. Just wanna let you know, you can actually turn your video off in the bottom left-hand corner, you can do that. And that way you can save yourself from having to you know, find a sheet of paper and things like that. You can actually electronically turn your camera off if you desire to. As you notice right now, you can't see me. You just see my name. Okay, is everybody about done? Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll just kind of define your money personality. Uh, everybody will be something different. And then with the telephone. Kind of ignore that telephone in the background. Okay, so if your answers were mostly A's, so do I have any A's? Anybody have A's? Okay, Cecilia. Any other A's? If you have an A, just put, do you know how to do the chat? Or you can just wave your hand even for simplicity here. So all your A's, you're defined as a person who is a saver. So that's kind of your money personality type. Any B's? Any B's? Okay, you got two B's. So you just pick one that you have the most of. So if you have mostly A's, then you're an A. If you have mostly B's, then you're a B. So you can only have one, one option. So just kind of do a tally which are the ones that you have the most of. Okay, so we'll go back to B's. If you have more B's, you're a spender. And if you have more C's, you're defined as a stasher. You like stash in that casual way. If you're a D, you're a sponger. You're somebody that likes to go ahead and get what you need and what you want. If your letter E was your predominantly letter there, then you're a goal setter. You're someone that likes to set goals for your money. And if you're letter F, you're a dreamer. You're a dreamer. So those are just a, just a little trivia there to kind of let you know um, kind of where you are just based on this little survey. So things change and you can be a different person each day depending on where you are with your your situation and also depending on where we are with our climate. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll bring up the PowerPoint. Anybody have any questions before we start? Anybody want to share their personality type? You don't have to. We have a quiet group this morning. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, similar format as in the past. Um, so we'll just kind of roll on. All right, so this disclaimer here is just from the um, Certified Financial Counsel Bureau that's out of Washington, D.C., and they have been the primary source of the data and information that we bring from month to month. Uh, their information is put out by consumers so that we as consumers have good, valid information to make great financial decisions as we have to do that daily. Uh, so they're just saying that they don't want anything that I say um, because once they put the information out, they're not sure what people will actually say during their presentations. And also I have a couple of YouTube videos and some other resources presented this morning as well. Next slide. So we'll just take a brief look at our previous sessions. I have some new people here today and thank you so much for joining for the first time. So key thing here, we've been going since February, uh, February 1st, actually, of 2020. And these are some of the sessions that we've covered in the past. And our last sessions was on how to respond to spams and scams. And as you can see, we've talked about a variety of things and each month is a different topic. So if you are new for the first time, if you'd like to get a resource manual, let me know. We can still provide that for you. And also, if you'd like to get more details on any of the topics that you see on this list, just let us know as well. 
So each time it's a different information. And oftentimes when you go to different seminars or involve yourself in different presentations, sometimes it will be information that you can use for yourself personally, or it may be as a resource, something that you can share with friends and family members. So each, each topic, you might not have had any spams or scams, but you could share that with your family and your children or your sisters. You know, so just take the information, it's for you to use personally and also to share with others. Next slide. Okay, we'll skip that one, go to the next one. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about the biblical principles that were covered in the past and I'll let Deacon Moore take care of that. Okay, we've talked about several uh, principles. Some of them are summarized here. The first one was that God is the source. You know, as Christians, we we actually have a benefit over most people. You know, people worry and, and are concerned about their financial well-being. We realize as children of God, we actually have have the blessings just being in children of God. We know that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. So when we realize where things are sourced from, it should give us comfort to, to know that, that actually uh, the, the, the good things in life, uh, all things in life flow from God. The second one is giving is essential. We need to realize that uh, the gifts of God are given to us for a reason. God blesses us so we can be a, a blessing to others and to honor him. The third one is live on a margin. Uh, so many people spend up everything they have, and it's but it's a proven fact that a, that if a person only uh, saves a, a tenth of, of what they earn every month, uh, the, the, their lifestyle actually doesn't really change. So uh, Proverbs 22 and 3 says a, a prudent man foresees. You know, we, we we should actually expect things to break, emergencies to happen, and to not have fun set aside for those things is just unwise. Uh, the fourth one is, is is saving. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna work until I die. Uh, that's typically impossible unless you die immediately. It's good to have something um, set aside for yourself as time goes by, and the, you know many of these things are spoken of in the in in the world today. But once you make sure, once you understand that these things are also biblical principles, things like saving, being uh, prepared, uh, you know uh, that, that that's wisdom from God. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so this is kind of um, a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll be focusing a lot on uh, home ownership. What are your housing options? Whether uh, buying or owning is right for you. Understanding the steps to home ownership, that home ownership process. How do I qualify for a mortgage loan? Which loan type is best for you? The importance and benefit of working with a realtor. Ways to save money on your mortgage and ways to pay off your loan early. And some things that you want to be aware of when you, um, if you're close to losing your home. Some things that you can either lose your renting home, which is an apartment or duplex or something, but you can also lose your primary resident, a home that you purchased. So you wanna make sure you're aware of some things to keep you from losing your housing, whichever style that may be. Uh, we'll look at the impact of COVID-19 on the housing industry. Uh, we we'll talk about some housing concerns and options during retirement. So we're all in different places. Some are at the stage where we're wanting to buy a home or we're looking at renting our first place. And then others are nearing um, you know, the retirement time. So what are my options when I get close to retirement? Uh, then you want to even know, even in that, will I um, be eligible for a skilled nursing care? There, there's a lot of rules and regulations, uh, even just to be able to get skilled care later in your life. So we wanna talk about that. We also wanna talk about the benefits of having long-term care insurance. And that's another thing that we'll, we'll talk about. There's some pros and cons to that, like with most things. So as a consumer, we have to look at any of all of these tools, have all the information that we can before we make any decision, whether it's buying a home, renting a home, or getting long-term care, or looking at skilled care. So. Those are the topics we'll be covering today, and we will have this presentation if you can't take all the notes that you need, if we're moving a little bit fast, we got a lot of information. We will have this up on YouTube in, say, about a week. That should be available for you that, that might want to go back and look at more details. 
And we also want to, want to point out that uh, this presentation will, will be put online at the end of this meeting also. Normally, I want to have it up before the meeting, but uh, it will definitely be there after this meeting. So you actually have a copy of this presentation as well as the actual video on YouTube. Then you would just go back to our Main Street Baptist Church website and you will be able to access it there. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, we're just going to take a little poll and you can just uh, unmute yourself if you want to participate. What would you say are the five top um, housing options? What would you say are housing options? These are housing options for individuals, families, or any combination thereof. What are housing options? What do you think about when you hear that? Buying a house is one. Very good. Okay, buying. Mm -hmm. okay. Leasing. Leasing. Uh huh. Renting. Okay, renting. Mm -hmm. Share okay. sharing. 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 Good. Rent to own. Rent to uh -huh. own. Rent to mm -hmm. own. Okay. Uh, any others? I say um, communal living. I, I would think more yeah. like communal living. That's in, like in a nursing home and assisted oh, okay. care. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Stand with Big Mama. <laughs> yeah, <with mama>. <laughs> <laughs> surfing, right? We're surfing with Big Mom. Yes, that's that's another housing option. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah, there are all kinds of ways and places that you can live, and um, each night, so everybody does a little bit differently. So there's no wrong or right. It just depends on your personal preference and what you're able to do at that time. So today we're going to mainly focus on that renting, and we're going to focus on home ownership. So and then the communal living with the retirement living. All right, next slide. Okay, so when we think about the own or do I rent, that's always a question people get faced with, you know, at different stages of their lives. So we're just gonna look at some of the advantages of owning your own property. So we'll look at that one first, okay? So there are some advantages. You have a more stable monthly payment. You know what your payment's going to be every month unless you have a change in your escrow account, meaning your taxes and insurance goes up. Uh, that stability, you can have that even for your children, for the school stability, being able to send them to the same neighborhood school or, or the school that you choose based on that address that you have. Uh, Long-term investment, you build equity as value increases. So as your equity goes up, that's more value in that property, and that's something that's liquid later when you sell that home. Uh, it's predictable. Again, those monthly payments. You can bring an extra income by renting a room in your home if you so choose. And you have some tax uh, benefits from being a homeowner as well. And as far as renting, let's look at the advantages to renting. It's less expensive up front. You know, there's, with home ownership, there will be costs. But with renting, you may have just a deposit and sometimes a deposit in first month's rent. Uh, there's more flexibility. It's easy to relocate. If you're not certain you want to live in a particular town, then you may rent versus buying so that you'll be able to move quickly. Uh, there's repairs. Of, they belong to someone else. They would not be your problem when something breaks down. You would call your landlord or property manager. Uh, you know what you're paying each month in most cases. So you're normally under 12 month lease and for that whole 12 month period, that would be your fixed set in uh, cost for your housing each month. Uh, we'll look at the disadvantages of home ownership. Uh, you could have high down payments and closing cost fees. Uh, sometimes people have not prepared and want to own a home, but there will be upfront costs that you would have to pay to own that property. And sometimes that can be a little bit more challenging or a disadvantage, and that would be those closing cost fees. Uh, you cannot re relocate easily. That means that if you got a better job and got that great job you've been waiting for for years and now you got to sell the house, it's not impossible, but it just put a little bit more uh, things that you have to get done before you can take that job. Uh, your equity grows slowly. You know, you will build that equity, but over time, so in those first probably 10 years, you're mainly paying that interest on that property versus anything on that principal. 
uh, the value of your property can fall, you know, depending on what kind of market we're in. You can sometimes lose money in owning a home. Just depends on the market. Um, but over time, things tend to come back, even with, you know, stocks and real estate as well. Home repair and maintenance costs. So when that washing machine goes down, then that belongs to you. There's no landlord to call. And then whatever repairs that are necessary, those will be things that you have to do. And disadvantages for renting, there's no tax incentives, and we have that twice. And there's the payments are not fixed and, and can increase. So as year to year, you could get a rent increase from your landlord. Things may have changed, values have gone up, you know, and sometimes uh, landlords may have specific time frames. Okay, we're gonna increase this unit every two to three years based on certain conditions. Uh, so that's at their prerogative to do so. And not building equity. And that's probably one of the key ones when you're renting, it, but sometimes that's the best choice. All right, any questions on renting versus owning? Okay, next slide. Okay, so this one, uh, Dick Moore, did it ever come up? Uh, no, um, did, did you send me a new one? Because I, I never, this one doesn't work right here. That, that one didn't come up for you? Okay, mm -hmm. let me see. Because I tested them all. I, I will bring, uh, did I email you? So, let me see, let me see if I can bring that one up. Well, we will go on and I will, no, if you want to just pause this for a second, let me get that because it's pertinent for right now, so I hate to move move forward. I have a, um, I can send you this email link. Give me just a second. Good thing about technology, I'm always learning, but I'm not afraid to learn, so that's, that's a good thing that we get to learn as we go. You know, while she's looking for that, just the general conversation about buying versus renting. Uh, there, there used to be a mindset that says, you know, you should always buy a house. And, and um, being someone who has been an investor for many years, and by the way, I do own a home, you know, so I'm not speaking against home ownership, but I do want to point out to you that buying versus rent, renting is a financial decision. There are, there are some people who it's better for them to buy. Other folks, it's better for them to actually rent. And you should not have that mindset, well, it's always best to buy a house. You know, I'll give you an example. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because as Ms. Beverly is, is finding things there. If, if I am someone who has just finished college and I am uh, getting my first job and my job is a job as an IT person or, or, or someone like that, someone where I may move quite, quite a bit, it may be best for me to actually rent. Because unless you're going to stay in a house for five years or so, that's probably not a good idea. Because if you get a job the next year, then then now you're stuck with the house. Whereas if I'm someone who's stable, who has the who has the income, who plan on being this in, in this city for years, then you know I, I could buy. Or let's go back to that person who actually is going to be moving in a year. If that person has the mindset to, that says I'm going to buy a house now, and I may move in a year, but I can rent that house out you know, from a different city, and then so okay to buy. And and my only point there is that you really need to think it through, talk to people you trust and say, what is best for my situation? So don't always assume that buying is the answer or renting is the answer. I always say wisdom is the answer. Great points. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, I've just sent over an email to you. Let's see if that opens up. And even in all that, everything requires a certain amount of planning, especially so that you have the adequate time to really make a good decision. I think I have it here. Okay, let's see if that one opens. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Ask Jamin. I am Nikki Willis and I'm Jamie. And each week we come to you with another question that many of our clients are asking us. This week's question is how do I prepare myself for home ownership? All right, boo, take it away. 
this is a very popular question that people ask is how do I prepare myself for home ownership? What do I have to do to get myself prepared, get ready? What are the steps that I have to take to um, be a homeowner? The first thing that you need to do is establish a vision of what type of house that you want and not just I want to buy a house. Uh, get into the details, get into the specifics. Do you like a two story or do you want a ranch? Do you need a formal dining room? Do you want a fenced in backyard? Get really detailed. Think about location. Think about the location of where you work, um, mm -hmm. where your kids may go to school. Um, where you may go to church, um, where you like to hang out. Um, establish a vision of what you want. Don't just say, I want to buy a house. Um, get very detailed about it. Um, the second thing that you want to do is to prepare yourself for home ownership. For the most part, about 75% of us, when we buy a home or our first home, we get a mortgage. Um, so the second thing you would want to do is focus on your credit. So to prepare to be a homeowner, uh, you need to have about a 620 or higher credit score. Um, so you want to get your credit score up to a 620 or higher, or as high as you can get it to uh, be, mm -hmm. um, in order to purchase a house and get prepared. The next thing is, uh, it may sound like a daunting number, um, but you want to get 20% or as much as possible to put down on a down payment. I know that sounds like a daunting number, uh, but the reason why I say or as much as possible is um, there's a lot of down payment assistance programs available, especially for first time home buyers, um, to where you can get down payment assistance and you can use your funds in addition to uh, down payment assistance or assistance from a family member. You can receive gift funds, um, so you don't always have to put down just the minimum requirements. You can put down as much as possible, um, which is what I recommend because the more you put down, the less your mortgage will be. Okay. Now, the next one, um, you always talk about having three to six months expenses. Yep. All right. Go ahead and tell us more about that. So more importantly than putting down as much of a down payment as possible is you want to have three to six months of monthly expenses and savings. This is super important because if there's one thing that I can guarantee in the process of buying a home is if something doesn't break down with the home, something is going to break down with you. If something doesn't break yeah. down with you, something's <laughs> going to break down with your car. Right. And you don't want to be house poor. That's right. So, That's our uh, motto. Yeah, we so, do not want you house poor. <laughs> yeah. So to yeah. prepare yourself for home ownership, uh, I, I recommend that to be prepared is to have three to six months of monthly ex monthly expenses in savings uh, for a rainy day, uh, something uh, going wrong, and so you have mm -hmm. that cushion. Okay. All right. What's the um, another thing to prepare yourself for home ownership? To prepare yourself for home ownership, I call this the big four. So there's four major things that will prevent you or stop you from buying a house right now or in the near future. Um, the big four is you want to be at least two years out of a bankruptcy. Okay. Um, the second one is you want to be two years or longer out of having a car repossessed. Um, the third thing is you want to not have any student loans that are delinquent. They can be deferred, but not delinquent. Okay. Um, and then the fourth thing is you want to go 12 months without being 30 days late on anything on your credit report. So okay. no 30 day lates on your credit report um, over the next 12 months. Okay. So no bankruptcies in the past two years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, your student loans need to be current, not necessarily, um, they can be deferred, but mm -hmm. just not delinquent. Correct. Um, no repossessions in the past two years. Mm -hmm. And 12 months with no 30-day late yep. payments. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the big four. That's the big four. All right. Um, another thing is you want to focus on uh, consider a 15-year mortgage versus a 30-year mortgage. Everybody automatically assumes that you're going to get a 30-year mortgage, but, you know, 
what would you rather be in debt for 15 years or in debt for 30 years um, look at it consider it yeah. sometimes the numbers may not work out but look at the difference between a 15 year and a 30 year mortgage you may find that you can actually afford it um, a lot of times you'll get a slightly lower interest rate for mm -hmm. being a uh, for a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage yeah. and you pay more on that principal every mortgage payment with a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage and you can you know pay less interest you get out of debt um, with a 15 year versus a 30 year mortgage sometimes yeah. the numbers just don't work out yeah um, but, but at least consider it, yeah right? you don't know yeah. until you look and consider and, and do the numbers do the work um, and research it and see the difference and see if it's something that you may want to consider yeah absolutely so that was a quick crash course on things to consider and think about um, when preparing to purchase a home if you want um, the real course, the one where we go through, and we all can end it there. All of it, we offer a free course called oh. How to Prepare. Okay, let's see if I can get my Zoom back up and going. Okay, all right. So that just gave us some 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 tips. I mean, there's a whole lot more to a home ownership course, and this is not a hundred percent of everything that you need to know and do. But that gives you a kind of an overview of some key things to keep in mind as you're considering to make home ownership an option for you. Uh, a couple of them that I wanted to kind of talk about quickly that he did say, that 620 credit score, that's kind of like a minimum score. Uh, like I said, a higher score will give you more options for like conventional financing. The 620 we do with governmental or FHA financing. And as far as the 20% down, another benefit of that is that you avoid what's called private mortgage insurance. That's an additional fee that you'll pay every month until you have 20% equity in that home. So it's always good if you can do the 20%, it will save you monthly, but that's not always the case for everybody. And that PMI can stay on for many, many years. And it could be as low as 50, I've seen it when I was doing mortgages, $50 a month, and I've seen it even higher. So it's gonna be based on your purchase price or your loan amount. And then having that emergency fund. Yeah, we always wanna plan and have that fund available because things will and do break down. So we wanna be prepared in that way. All right, anybody else have any questions about any of those? I wanna talk, I may have, interest or want to know more quickly that we can share anything Deacon more anything that you want to share on any of those tips that they gave us um i was going to cover this during the top 10 reasons to hire a real estate agent but i will just quickly talk about pmi um since you mentioned that there are tricks to the trade and 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 i'll just quickly say that that's why an experienced agent may, may, may come in handy but one trick that i've used for, for my clients and i should, should say a trick it's a process is that if you want to avoid pmi uh, one thing you can do is have your first mortgage be at 80 percent you can then go get a second mortgage quickly mm -hmm. for the other, you know, 15%. And really you're only putting 5% down, but then you don't pay PMI. And, and you know, and, and, and please understand, I'm not giving you a hard and fast rule. This is just <laughs> something to consider. And these are options that you have. And this is why, again, you know, it really the answer for me is always wisdom. You know, talk something through because what I just said may save you 75 bucks a month. Well, it may be a bad idea, but it's best to have a conversation on those kind of things because for folks who've done this for a long time, and just so you know, I've been an investor for 30 plus years, you know, I've learned quite a bit. And by the way, if I say the word I, during this whole process, please know that I'm speaking mm -hmm. about all experienced real estate people. But, uh, you know, when I say I, just, just the way I talk there, but having an experienced advisor is important and, and always consider your, your process or your situ situation unique. Okay, thank you for that. And the main reason for that PMI, that's to cover the lender in case of a default. So they are very serious about that PMI, just in case you walk away from that mortgage. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's go back there.
Okay, we got 12 steps to becoming a homeowner. <coughs> well, um, well, we'll skip that one since we did the other one. So next okay. slide. And if you want to go view that, you can do that later as well. As well. Okay, so what are the monthly costs of having a, a mortgage? So we'll, we'll look at these components. Um, the first one will be your principal. So with that principal, that's the amount, amount uh, based on the amount that you borrowed. This is part of the cost for buying that home. So that's the principal portion that you pay. And then the interest, that would be the part that you are paying based on your interest rate that you are able to secure. So the lower the interest rate, the less you pay towards the interest portion of your payment. That mortgage insurance, that PMI we talked about a little bit. Um, then you're going to have your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance, and those are required, but most people escrow those, add those to the payment, but that's not always a requirement 100% of the time. There are some options where people pay their escrow outside of their mortgage payment. So those components will make up your total monthly payment and if you're going to have a mortgage. Next slide. So understanding your loan options. So not all home loans are the same. So we just kind of look at some, some different options here and what makes up that, uh, that loan amount. Uh, so we're going to have the loan terms. You're going to have that interest rate and what type and the loan type. So you're going to have uh, the terms of the loan, what kind of interest rate, and what type of loan that you will have. Next slide. All right, so the loan type, so it, like they talked about in the video, you could do a 30 year, you could do a 15, or you could do another option in terms of, I've seen people do 20 years. I've seen people do that 30 years and then they would pay an extra payment a year to reduce that interest over time. So those loan types are, they're flexible, but depending on how comfortable and what you're able to pay every month. Uh, the term of your loan is how long that you have to repay that loan. So you repay for 30 years, 15 years, or all the defined amount of time. Uh, the choice affects your monthly principal and interest payment. So if you're paying interest on 15 years, that's going to be a lot less than paying over that 30 years. And that's going to be considerably less when you can pay a 15 versus a 30. So your interest rate, if you have a 6% versus a 3%, then you can have a much lesser in your monthly payment, so allow you to pay your principal off sooner. How much interest will you pay over the life of that loan? So those things are impacted by the long term. So if you're gonna to wanna to look at how you compare that, so for a shorter term, you will have a higher monthly payment, but typically you'll have a lower interest rate and a lower total cost involved in buying that house. But if you take that longer term, speaking of that 30-year mortgage, you're going to have a lower monthly payment, and you're going to have typically higher interest rates and higher total costs. Next slide. Okay, so I'm just <clears throat> kind of doing an overview of this one. So about that long term, I'm just going to tell you again how long you have to keep it. Those shorter ones will give you a shorter time to pay, shorter interest rates. So the one I want to focus on here, uh, Third bullet down. There are two reasons shorter terms can save you money. Because you're borrowing money and you're paying interest for a short amount of time. So I think we got that one. And the interest rate is usually lower by as much as a full percentage point. And I've seen it even be lower. So shorter term always can uh, yield a better uh, savings. Always compare the official loan offers that you get. So anytime you're going to get a mortgage, you're going to get what's called a good faith estimate from your lender and it's always good to compare from lender to lender so every lender has different rates um, based on different requirements each uh, borrower they will have so always i would shop that around at least get three options uh, when you're shopping for a mortgage and if you're really sincere about that at that time when you go to they pull your credit so when you're doing a mortgage check then it doesn't impact your credit score because you're shopping around for a mortgage. So they're gonna expect for you to have a couple of hits on your credit, but they won't ding you for everyone. They kind of collect those and I think they give you a period of time to kind of shop around. Some lenders- And, and, and th that's a very good point there. And I wanna just make sure you, 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 you get at that one. Shopping for a real estate loan is different from shopping for a car loan, as an example. 
if you go out and shop for a car loan and you go to you know three banks then all three of those will show up on your credit and they will ding you for three inquiries whereas with a house you can go out and shop for the three banks and they won't they'll only ding you for, for one so what she just said there is very important and it's different for different things so don't assume home shopping is like shopping for furniture or a car All right, thank you for that point. All right, so that's also what's called a balloon loan. Okay, uh, monthly payments are low, but you have to pay a larger, uh, your, your payment could become due sooner. So in some ARM products like a 5-1 ARM, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you're gonna have uh, a consistent payment on a balloon for a set period of time, but when they say, okay, it's for a one year period of five and one, then after that uh, period is over, then you're gonna start having increases every year on that mortgage. So I wouldn't suggest a balloon payment unless you're hoping to move out, uh, move, mm -hmm. move away. Sometimes balloons can be the right answers for you. All right, next slide. Can I give an example of that real quick? Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with I agree with Sister Beverly um, that balloon payments in many cases is not the right thing to do. I'll give an example that I use personally when it was the right thing to do. When I actually first moved to, to Kentucky, I bought my first house and I was single. And I was dating this young lady named Lisa Moore. And I actually knew that once I got married, I would, you know, the house that I lived in at first was like my house and she wanted something that was called our house. <laughs> so I actually got a balloon payment, a five-year balloon payment, because I was 99.382% sure that before <laughs> the five years was up, we would move from that house. So I was able to, to get like a 1% rate when I bought the house because it was gonna balloon in five years. But again, now, am I recommending that for everyone? I'm not. I'm just saying that that is a unique situation where I knew I would not be there in five years. And just so you know, mm -hmm. we actually moved in two. So I got to, because mm -hmm. what balloon payments do is they give you a very low rate up front, but in five years, you got to pay it all back. So, you know, that's why, again, wisdom is mm -hmm. the answer. Look and say, what's special or unique about my situation? Okay, very good. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so interest rate type. So interest rates come in two basic types. It can be a fixed or they can be adjustable rates. Whether your interest rate, you know, it's going to depend on whether your interest rate can change, whether your monthly principal and interest payments can change, and um, the amount. So those are all based on the interest rate. How much interest you would pay over the life of the loan. So again, geared towards that interest rate. So if you have a fixed rate, uh, you're going to have lower risk and no major surprises. You're going to have a higher interest rate than an adjustable rate in many cases, but your rate does not change, and so sometimes that's the right answer. Uh, your monthly principal and interest payments, they stay the same for the life of that loan, unless your taxes or insurance would, would change. So historically, and as you look at the data below, um, this kind of tells you the buck of the home buyers or people Choices, um, so that's 2008 through 2014, 85 to 90% of the people chose a fixed rate mortgage. But over historically, you can see it was lower. So fixed rate mortgages are right at the right time for the right person. So adjustable rate, you're gonna pay a higher, you're gonna have a higher risk you know, with that one because you may have to have that balloon payment. And so there is some uncertainty if you're not, um, astute about what you're doing. There'll be lower interest rates to start. After the initial fixed period, your rate can increase or decrease based on the market. Uh, your monthly principal and interest payments can increase or decrease over time. So if you look at the historical data below, then you can see that there are people that do choose those adjustable rate mortgages. And historically, you know, there's been a great number of people that have those adjustable rate mortgages. And when you go to the bank, they don't normally ask you, they normally present a, a 30 year. So as you want and learn and know your different options, you can say, hey, can I get a good faith estimate on what your look like for me? Even though 
typically they're going to gear you towards a 30. Uh, that's kind of why they start out. And then you just look at your different options and let me look at what a balloon payment would look like. You know, I'm hoping to move back home to the Carolinas or whatever your needs may be, but look at your options. So that's why having these tools can kind of let you know that you too can be part of the game. Because sometimes when we go into the banks and not have any information, we just go with what they present. But mm -hmm. this education and knowing, say, hey, I do have some options. Can I look at some of the other options and be able to be okay to ask for those things? Next slide. All right, so this is kind of some just data, and, and most of it we've kind of covered. We talked about the adjustable rates, but that 5-1 arm is fixed for the first five years and then adjusts each year after that. So, so it's marketed to lower credit scores. Um, sometimes they will give uh, adjustable uh, rates. I would say that when I was doing mortgages for the banks, it was that 228 was very prevalent, which means it was fixed for two years. And then after that two years, you either had to refinance that loan or you had to pay it all back. And so that did get a lot of people in trouble. And um, that 228 mortgage saying it was fixed for those two years. You get a much better interest rate. It was low up front. It got many people in the homes, which was a good thing. But then they were not prepared for that two years afterwards. What do I do with this two year? You know, it's coming up. I need to refinance it. Uh, I lost my job during that time. My credit has bombed out. Now, what am I going to do? You know, I got to make some uh, uh, choices with this mortgage. And sometimes that's been a, a challenge for many people. So if you have a credit score in the mid 600s or below, you might be offered arms that contain that risk of feature like higher rates, rates that adjust more frequently, uh, even with prepayment penalties. And that was a big thing back many, many years ago where people had to pay large penalties to even get out of a loan. And so loan balances can increase. So all of those features are things that you want to make sure that you're asking good questions. Is there a prepayment penalty on my mortgage? You know, is this a fixed rate if I'm not comfortable with, I don't want an arm? You know, so be sure just to get in the conversation and, and know that you have options and be able to speak those options. Next slide. I want to add to that also. Mm -hmm. don't, don't assume that your banker knows all the answers. Point number one, you, you know, ask multiple people. Also, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to ask questions. I, I, I meet so many people because their banker said something, they took his or her word for it, and they just went off there and they got something that they shouldn't have, have, have gotten. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've, been, I've been involved in real estate for 30 plus years. I still have a mentor, even now. I have someone that I go back and I ask questions. And we, we have a habit of, of feeling like, you know, we, we need to know everything. And, and I'm not, I don't want to give you the impression that real estate is complicated, but there are lots of variables. And it is okay to ask questions because, you know, many people get in trouble because someone says something and they said, do you understand? And they go, yeah, yeah, I understand. If you don't understand, you know, the... The, the dollar values are too high for you to just go off and act like you understand when you really don't. And I'll say again, even though I've been doing this for 30 plus years and have made a su successful career out of doing this, I still ask questions. I actually have lunch with my accountant, with my mentor, with my lawyer once a quarter just to know what's going on. And, and I'm an experienced person. Very good. Next slide. Okay. So the loan type. So uh, you probably have heard of many of the options. I mean, you may have already experienced some of these. The conventional loan, the FHA, and there are other special programs as well. Uh, so mortgage loans are organized into different categories based on the size of the loan and whether they are part of a government program. So each loan type is designed for different situations. Sometimes only one loan type will fit your situation. So if multiple options fit your situation, try out different scenarios, you know, again, asking lenders and also you can take those good faith estimates to your, your counter partners or your, you know, advisors as well. You know, don't feel like you're pressured, like you said, you know, oftentimes you want to make a good decision. So don't feel pressured to, to give answers and to sign documents without 
pertinent information. So you want to choose the right loan type. Um, so that's going to affect how much you will need for a down payment. So if you're doing an FHA, you're not going to need that 20%, but you will have that PMI. Uh, the total cost of your loan is going to vary depending on the loan type that you choose and how much you can borrow in the house price range, all are leading back to that loan type that you get back to whether it's conventional, FHA, and there are others as well. Next slide. Okay, so I'll just give you some a little bit breakdown on the different ones. The majority of the loans are conventional, and in the conventional loans, you're paying down at 20 percent, or you're doing a 20. You know, you can do a first and second. Uh, FHA, and oh, back to the convention, <coughs> typically costs less than an FHA loan, but become harder to get because your credit for that conventional loan is going to need to be closer to the 700. Oh, excuse me, on the 680, you know, with the 620, the government is a little bit more lenient. You know, if you can prove good job time and stability, they will look at some of the FHA products for you. But a conventional loan, they're going to want to make sure that you have some skin in the game as well. FHA and lower down payment, and there are down payment assistance. So I do have information on that. If anybody's interested in that, I can give you that later. Uh, FHA, FHA is available to, to those with the lower credit scores, and there are those special programs such as the VA for the veterans, uh, USDA loans for the rural areas, and some other local uh, loans based on uh, different communities. Next slide. Before we go forward, I want to give a quick mm -hmm. example. Um, have two friends that I just worked with in the last 90 days. Uh, friend one wanted to buy a house and we did some checking. And by the way, both of these guys are guys who are recently out of the army, okay? When we checked the loans uh, back about 90 days ago, person one, uh, after we checked, and we did this, to, we, we did this to, to, together for him, the VA loan was the best thing for him because they had a special on rates at that time. Person B found a house 45 days later <laughs> and we checked and, and, and FHA was the best thing for him. Here are two guys, both have money saved, both found a house in the same price range, but one of them, because of the timing, VA was best. The other person, FHA was best there. And the point here is that we're giving you guidelines and everything you see here is, is correct. But understand that it's always good to go off and check and see what is the best thing for me at this time because rates change every day. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good point, yes. Next slide. Okay, so we've talked about that mortgage insurance a little bit, so we won't go too much here other than that 20% down or a second mortgage to kind of avoid that. And even when markets have been good, people have been able to refinance out of their um, primary loan that they started with and say five years in, if the market was good and their home built a lot of equity, they were able to get out of that PMI as well. So that's another option to to get out of it and keep an eye on what, you know, if the things are going good, if you're buying into certain neighborhoods, I've noticed the equity builds faster, you know, new construction areas, if you get in early and as they build around you, the prices go up. And then maybe in that four or five years, you will have built more equity and can get rid of the PMI. All right, so uh, next slide. Oh, let's, let's take a look at that last one. Your credit score will suffer, you know, if you, um, don't pay your mortgage and you can face foreclosure if you don't pay so yeah buying a home is very very important just like renting you know so we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that but yeah you don't want to fall behind on your payments whatever form of housing that you choose making your payment whether you're renting whether you're owning you have to make that a priority to pay your monthly payment next slide Okay, the cost of purchasing a home, let's see if this one works. And I tried to pick really short, short videos and they give some good points. Can you all see that? Not yet. Okay, hang on then, let me unshare. Okay. And reshare.
about that. Yes. There are a lot of costs associated with purchasing a home. When making the decision to buy a home, it's important to know and consider all the different costs that you will pay. There are three basic kinds of costs involved in buying a home. The cost of the home itself, the cost of the mortgage loan, and the real estate costs. The cost of the home itself is the price you agree to pay the seller. Then there's the cost of the mortgage, which is the price you pay to borrow money to buy the home. Lastly, you have real estate costs that include the costs of transferring the property to you, as well as ongoing taxes and maintenance costs. You pay part of these costs up front when you close on your home and part over time. Up front, you'll pay part of the cost of the home itself with your down payment. You'll also pay closing costs, which include both mortgage costs and real estate costs. Upfront mortgage costs include fees you pay to your lender, like an origination fee, fees for services, like appraisal fees and title insurance, and sometimes upfront mortgage insurance fees. Upfront real estate costs include property transfer taxes and other government fees. You pay the rest of the costs over time. The amount you borrowed is known as the principal. Part of the mortgage payment you make each month will go toward paying off that principal. Another part of your monthly payment goes to pay interest on the loan. If you made a small down payment, less than 20% of the home's price, you will also typically pay mortgage insurance. You'll also have to pay ongoing real estate costs, like property taxes, homeowners insurance, and homeowners association dues. These costs can increase over time. For many people, taxes and insurance costs are bundled into your monthly payment which means your monthly payment can increase even if you have a fixed rate loan. Because there are so many costs associated with buying a home, it's important to talk to your real estate agent and lender and ask them how much you can expect to pay and when. Kind of like a little review and summary of what we've already kind of discussed, but a different kind of layout. Anybody have any questions thus far? Okay, well, next slide. I, I kind of do. Okay, go ahead, Cecilia. <laughs> um, and I don't want to make it just about what I'm thinking, but I, um, I wanted to know, like, if somebody wanted to find, like, a multi-use farm property, um, could they get an FHA and uh, um I forgot the name of the other one. <laughs> SDA. Yeah. Yes. Normal. Oh, what was the last part you said? Yeah, yeah, I want to know if you could apply for both of those or just one. Okay. okay can, Normally, I, can I help with that one? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you can apply for for as many as you want, but I wouldn't recommend that approach. What I'd recommend you do is, is look and see at that time what is the best option for you because it, uh, uh, actually applying for something is, is, your, is your action. So okay. you do your homework ahead of time. For example, if someone actually wanted to buy land, there are actually farm loans. There's Kentucky okay. housing loans. You, you know, mm -hmm. there's the FHA loan, and there are there there are conventional loans. So I I think when you're saying applying, let me let me, let me divide it here. There is nothing that prohibits you from legally applying for okay. multiple things, but I would recommend you do that. I recommend you go out and study multiple things and then say which one is the best for, for, for me. If someone was looking for land as an example, what I would probably do is say, let's look at farm loans and let's look at Kentucky housing loans as an example. But, but again, you know, that's what I'm saying in general knowledge. Of course, if you came to me with that or any experienced agent, what they should do is say, let me do some homework and see what gives you the best deal for right now. But, but a general answer is, probably Kentucky housing or a farm loan. Thank you for that. Right, and most times you're only, you can't combine, so you can't do USDA and FHA. So if you're right. looking to have two components from two different loan types, normally that's a no-no. You either have mm -hmm. the one or the other, okay? All right, next slide.
Okay, so this will be just a short um, way to look at that payment. Okay, hang on here. Okay. And I know you current homeowners, you all probably could teach this class as well. So thank you all for your patience there. Hi, I'm Tony Anderson. I'm a licensed real estate agent in the state of Florida. And I'm going to show you how to calculate a mortgage payment when it includes taxes and insurance. You may have heard this referred to as a PITI payment. That stands for your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. This is important to know when your lender escrows those on a monthly basis and then annually pays them on your behalf. For example, a $200,000 mortgage on a 30-year fixed term at 6% will have a principal and interest payment of $1,200 per month. Now let's assume in this example that your taxes on an annual basis are $1,200. So your lender will escrow the $1,200 annually. We divide that by 12, and they will add $100 per month to your mortgage payment. Again, let's assume your insurance for your house is $600 a year. Again, we divide that by 12, and on a monthly basis, your lender will escrow $50 a month. That makes your total monthly mortgage payment $1,000 $350. I'm Tony Anderson, and that's how you calculate a monthly mortgage payment, including taxes and insurance. Okay, next slide. Ms. Pat, did you have a question? Okay. Pat? All right, next slide. Oh, no, I'm just saying that was very good uh, information. Okay. okay. Okay, so we'll take a quick look at this one, um, and then we're going to transition to some of the other um, parts of our discussions this morning. I thought this was good to show you that you can pay off that mortgage earlier, and you don't have to, even if you have a 30-year mortgage, you, you have some options. So we'll scroll down some. If you could scroll it down a little bit and keep scrolling. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, scroll down a little bit more. Let me make sure if this is the same one. Yeah, so this one here just gives you some tips on how you can do that. And this would be something that you have access to. And it show you, we'll scroll back up a little bit. It, Okay, so in this, it gives you where you can take this tool and you'll be able to apply to your unique situation and um, looking at the closing costs, what's involved, so that you can make, you know, some sound decisions when it comes to your finance in your home. So you should be able to click on this document once you go to the online version and it should come up for you so that you can print it. Next slide. Okay, so I'll let my dear brother take over the benefits of working with a realtor, and we will uh, conclude the home ownership component, and we'll move into some other housing types and some other options. Okay, you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Again, I apologize. I'm going to do my best to not say I, but if I do, understand that everything I say is, is applicable to any good, experienced real estate agent. Please know that I'm not saying any real estate agent because um, I have a personal note. I, uh, I'm amazed at the number of times I actually have get calls from friends that say I hired my friend who just became an agent because I want to help him out, but I'm I'm concerned. Can, can you advise me? <laughs> and and uh, I want to uh -oh. point out to you. I can't hear. You can't hear, Miss Pat. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay. Pat, can you hear me? Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah, it just kind of freezes uh, every now and then. Okay, that's probably your internet, and I apologize for that. Because, but I do you like now. Okay. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> All right, but my <laughs> point, my my point is that um, please understand that real estate is probably one of the largest um, investments someone's going to make in their lifetime. And you, if, you, if you're going to hire an agent or, or if you're considering hiring an agent, please treat it like that. This, is, this, this isn't the time to do a favor for a friend because so many people get bad advice because they have inexperienced uh, people. Miss, um, Miss Beverly asked me to give the top 10 reasons why you, you want to hire an agent. Um, the, the first one is, is knowledge and, and and experience, you know, um, there is ton, there's tons of paperwork involved with, with purchasing real estate. There are tons of decisions to, to be made. Should I buy, as, as an example, uh, if you actually get a loan, you actually buy title insurance for, for, for the bank. You, you, you have no choice mm -hmm. in that. But do you get homeowners, homeowners or, or your own personal title insurance? Yes or no? Those are decisions you have to make. If you buy a home, uh, what is the advantages of a crawl space versus a, a slab? Do I need a variable rate or a fixed rate? What about PMI insurance? What about the time value of, of money? Many people don't un understand, you know, someone, when someone just, just tells them, hey, you know, if you get a 30-year loan versus a 15-year loan, you, you actually pay pay more. Do you really? And, and I won't get into the details of that, but when you factor in the time value of money, sometimes it's better to get a 30-year mortgage. Other times it's not. And, and things are, are, are different enough where there's no fixed answer there. So having someone with experience who can explain those things to you where you understand it is very important. Uh, number two is uh, saving your time and energy. You know, we always hate these phone calls we get get from from people but it's amazing once you put your phone number out there how many people actually call you and there are people out there who who are shysters who will call you and they'll talk you into things and sadly a lot of folks are nice people and it's hard to say no to folks but there are there are are are, are people out there who are doing schemes and 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 tactics that and, and I've actually hurt people's homes and property being stolen because they, they didn't know who they were speaking to at that time. So having an experienced agent can help you save time and energy and also can 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 protect you. Number three, an extensive knowledge of the neighborhood, uh, knowing what school districts are tied to what housing areas, knowing what, what changes are actually coming, the age of the neighborhood, crime in, in the uh, neighborhood. Um, uh, buying the most expensive property in the, on the block in that area, you know, there are pros and cons to those kinds of things. I'm not saying you have to take your uh, agents advice, but it's good to understand how those things can impact you. Also, which neighborhoods are increasing in value, which neighborhoods are, are declining in value. You know, those informations there are so important. Number four would be providing information on the current uh, conditions of the market. We have what's called a seller's market and a buyer's market, and those things change things. When you have a buyer's market, you know, you can come in perhaps and offer someone $10,000 less than they offered and possibly get the deal. We're in what's called a seller's market right now. I've actually had clients who actually offered $7,000 more than the, than the uh, seller was asking for, and they did not get the deal. You know, and, and, and having, having an idea of what's going on, uh, you know, what is the average sales price, the average sales time. You know, I actually sold a duplex uh, this year and it sold in one day. I, I, I sold 11 townhouses th this year. They sold in three days. And the point is that, you know, understanding that I have friends who I will call them and say, hey, uh, look at this house and they say, well, I'll call you back on Friday. I'm like, that place will be gone on Friday. And, 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 
and you understanding those things is very important. Uh, provide valuable price guidance. Um, you know, that is, that is so important because, again, th there are some hard and fast rules about loans and things like that, but things change. So, you know, should you go FHA? Should you go VA? Should you go to conventional? Do you want a farm loan? Uh, how do you want to price things? You know, can, can you avoid PMI insurance? Those are things that an experienced person would actually know. Number six, a professional network. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, and by the way, I'm, I'm very proud of this, but it's amazing how many of my, my former clients call me and say, hey, I've been in my house for a while, now my AC went out. Do you have someone who could help me out with, with, with that? Do I need a home warranty? Um, you know, all those things there are, are questions you may have and having an agent that has the connections to actually help you answer those questions uh, is very important to you. Um, number seven, help you in, in the negotiation process. It's, it's amazing what people can, can, can achieve and, and gain when they sit down and listen to the other person. There, there's so many things involved in buying a house. And, and you know, um, I give you a very good example is that uh, I actually had a client who, who wanted to buy a house and he was, he actually liked the, the washer and dryer that was inside the house. Uh, and it just so happened that the, the, the seller actually was looking to move to a new house and actually didn't want to take it w w with him. But just having a conversation about how the guy loved the washer and dryer ended up getting a free washer and dryer for, uh, out of that, that deal. Not saying it happens every time, but the point is that having someone who's who's listening to you, who's asking questions of the person on the other side may help you gain some advantage there. Number eight is helping with the paperwork. Um, it is amazing to me just how much paperwork is involved in, 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 in purchasing a home. The offers, the counter offers, the taxes, the disclosures, whether lay it's in the home or not. Um, you know, any questions you have about your options uh, as you purchase the home. Um, you know, th this is a time where um, if I were purchasing a home, I want someone who has some experience beside me to help me kind of just, just go through all the ins and outs. Number, number nine, uh, provide professional advice in respect to the closing process. Uh, for those of you who have bought a home, I'm sure you guys know this already. For those, for those of you who have not, you sign a ton of paperwork at a closing. I've had closings last for three hours because someone wanted to read every document. I've had some that last for 15 minutes because someone understood those things. But having someone in the room with you that you trust when you're signing your life away is kind of important. And the, and the last one is that can help you in future transactions. Um, you know, as I told you before, I'm, I actually meet with my, my lawyer, with my accountant, with my advisor once a quarter, because I want to know what's going on in the market, know what's going on there. Also, I, I give you a tip that, that I do, because, you know, you know, if you call an accountant and you say, hey, I want to meet with you, they'll say, well, my fee is 100 bucks an hour or 250 an hour. I've learned over the years to just take folks to lunch. It's amazing what you can learn by telling someone, hey, let me, let me buy lunch for you. So instead of me paying $2.50 an hour to my accountant, I, I buy them lunch and pay 20 bucks and I get the same knowledge. But the point is that that knowledge is now used to help you, 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 you out. Um, in, the past, in, the, in the earlier parts of this, this presentation, Ms. Bev, uh, mention foreclosures. There is no reason to go into a foreclosure. There are too many options out there. Having an agent who understands the process, uh, for some reason people get embarrassed and they end up in foreclosure and they call someone three months later and their credit is ruined for multiple years. Having someone who knows what's going on, you can call them, confidentially say, hey, 
I'm, I'm about to be foreclosed upon. Can you help me? You know, having someone who's experienced can, 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 you know, can be a godsend. I, I have friends that who have called me and no one knows but me and them, but, but, but they were saved from foreclosure. I have friends who told me a year later, I was foreclosed upon last year. And I'm like, you should have called, <laughs> you know. So my point again is, is, is wisdom solves problems. You know, always feel free to ask someone. Uh, a question. Last point, and a very important point, a real estate agent is a fiduciary, which means they have to act on your, in, in your best interest. They, they, so the, those conversations are confidential and they do things for your benefit. I'm not saying you should always get an agent, but as someone who's been doing this for years, and just so you know my experience, I actually have been an investor for 30 plus years. I've been an agent for about eight years now. But even when I was buying on my own, I used an agent. because There were too many unknowns out there. Great, those are some wonderful. Wonderful reasons to work with our, our agents. And thank you so much for sharing those. Next slide. There's so much information. So I, I just wanna, uh, we normally go until 11.30. And um, so we, we'll see how far we wanna go. So on this one, we don't have to go there because I wanna keep moving. And it just shows you some ways that you can make a bi-weekly payment and pay that mortgage off sooner, ways that you can take extra money applied to your principal, ways you can take your tax refund money once a year applied to your principal so that you can pay that mortgage off sooner. So you'll be able to access that a little bit later, but we're gonna go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, keep going, next slide. It talks about the closing calls. Um, so here it talks about some ways to avoid losing your house and whether that be a rental property or whether it's a home that you own and he was talking about those foreclosures. Uh, so this is some good information. So let's click on maybe just that first one for, and the other one is gonna be posted to our website, the one that's on the second, the last one on the uh, page here. So we go look at the uh, two so that people understand they have some housing options. Okay, did you click on the first or the second? Which one do we have there? That's the first That's the one. First. That's the first one. Okay, so scroll down. Okay, so yeah, scroll on down. Let's see how long does he take. Okay, and this just talks about prioritizing bills and understanding that you have to prioritize your bills, especially in a tight market, and so that you understand that your housing is your primary bill. And then it shows you some ways to look at your other bills and how to maybe get you know, some help from maybe your current credit card company, some ways to say, okay, is there some ways I can change payment dates or there's some other things I can do so that I can make sure that I'm paying my rent and I'm paying my mortgage. So we'll let you look at that one later and it'll be posted on our website so that you can go and look at that one. So the next slide. And then the second part of that, we'll post on our, our website as well, or you have access to it by clicking on it. Can I get assistance with my delinquent rent payments during COVID? And this one here is just a video that was put, uh, presented by our governor on August 24th. And it starts at video, you start at 14.52 so that you didn't have to listen to the whole components. So basically there is some relief uh, that's coming for both renters and their landlords. And so it speaks about that. And on September the 8th or 9th, I think next week or next 10 days, he will have a guideline as to those who will need some assistance with delinquent rent. So pay attention to the news, but if you wanna hear what the governor says, what well, he has available right now, and it kind of explains what his, his plans are for both the landlords and the tenants. So next slide. I can point out there quickly mm -hmm. also that, that Community Action actually has a program. I've actually helped several of my tenants um, receive assistance there and I've actually received the money. So I know the process works there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are programs out there. I, I don't, I haven't looked at the one that, that the governor is speaking of, but I know Community Action is doing that right now. 
Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. They do have the Kentucky Health Fund, and then they have the new fund, the coalition of people in the city put together. And I think that's the one that you're talking about to kind of help with that rent only. So can I get help with my delinquent mortgage during COVID-19? And so on this one, um, this has been put out by, you know, Freddie and Fannie Mac. Not everybody have a Freddie or a Fannie loan, so you will have to go to their website. And there's some particular things. So we'll go ahead and click on that video on that one real quick on that top one. And uh, and this is part of the CARES Act and showing what's available for those who have mortgages. And you might not be impacted, but you may know a friend or a family member that needs this information and afraid to ask somebody. If you are experiencing difficulty making on-time mortgage payments due to the national coronavirus emergency, forbearance may be an option for you. Forbearance can help consumers get back on their feet during short-term financial difficulty. But there are a few things you need to know and some important decisions you'll need to make. Forbearance is when your mortgage servicer, that's the company that sends your mortgage statement and manages your loan or lender, allows you to pause or reduce your payments for a limited period of time. Forbearance does not erase what you owe. You will have to repay any missed or reduced payments in the future. So, if you are able to keep up with your payments, keep making them. The types of forbearance available vary by loan type. If your mortgage is backed by the federal government, this includes FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac loans. Provisions of the recently enacted CARES Act allow you to temporarily suspend payments if you are experiencing financial difficulty due to the impact of the coronavirus on your finances. Loan servicers may also have forbearance or deferment options for non-government backed or private loans, but the exact options available to you may differ. Here's how this works for federally backed mortgages under the CARES Act. If you are experiencing financial hardship due to the coronavirus pandemic, you have a right to request forbearance for up to 180 days. You also have the right to request an extension for up to an additional 180 days. But you must contact your loan servicer to request this forbearance. There won't be any additional fees, penalties, or interest added to your account, but your regular interest will still accrue. Other than telling your servicer that you have a pandemic-related financial hardship, you won't need to submit additional documentation to qualify for this forbearance. It's important to find out what options are available to you. The best place to find that information is from your loan servicer. Look for their contact info on your monthly mortgage statement. Right now, most financial institutions, including mortgage servicers, are experiencing high call volumes, so there may be long wait times to talk to someone on the phone. Regardless of the type of mortgage you have or how you communicate with your servicer, here are some things to consider. If you cannot make your mortgage payments and you are looking to suspend or reduce your payments, you will need to work with your servicer. If you decide to move forward with a forbearance plan, ask your servicer how you will be required to pay back the amount owed after the forbearance period. Will you owe the entire unpaid amount in a lump sum once the pause period has ended or at the end of the loan term? Can the loan term be extended so that missed payments are added to the end of your mortgage? Will your subsequent monthly payments be higher for sure. a period of time to make up the deferred amount? Uh -huh. Finally, be on the lookout for scams and scammers looking to take advantage of consumers affected by coronavirus. You might receive fraudulent calls, emails, text messages, or other offers to help you reduce or stop your mortgage payments. Make sure you are working directly with your mortgage servicer. For more in-depth information, including information on how to find a HUD-approved housing counselor, go to consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. Okay, and then we'll briefly just open the uh, next um, one there and see if that one opens. But yeah, that's some good information for homeowners. And this is Freddie Mac. You know, he talked about FHA, VA. 
Now, this is Freddie Mac's version of their COVID-19 relief. And one of the things that I'll just point out here uh, is for the borrower, you must have a hardship and the hardships are all listed there. You can't just like, hey, I want to save and not pay my mortgage. You have to demonstrate a hardship, even though there's not a lot of other documentation required, but you must have a hardship to seek those protections. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about loan refinancing, and I think if you're a homeowner, you probably have heard that you can refinance your mortgage. And, um, and there's in, in the past, there have been a whole lot of good benefits to doing that. And that's where you just take your current loan, you go to the bank, you apply for a, a new loan to replace your existing loan. So good, it's been a lot of benefits over the years to do that. And um, so it's important because number bullet number three says you can adjust certain terms of that loan when you refinance, but two factors that don't change you won't eliminate your original loan, and you could take on more debt if you do a cash out refinance. And that was out, O-U-T, not O-U-R, uh, which extends your time to pay your loan off. So refinances have saved people lots of money. Uh, it does add back to your equity. If you don't go to the table with necessary money to close that out, some additional costs that you would have as a borrower wanting to refinance, so be careful not to overdo that. And uh, so now if you look down at the bottom here, your property might still be required as collateral. So oftentimes, even though you're refinancing, you still have your loan is secured by your home. Uh, the only way to avoid that is to do like personal unsecured loans. So if you got a small loan balance and you don't want, you just want to take some money out or say if you have paid your home in full and see a great need for just a, you know, a, a, a loan to get you through a situation, you can do a personal unsecured loan that will not link to your collateral being your home. So the next slide. Hang on, somebody asked a question, can you refinance a home loan more than once? And the answer is yes. yes. You can re mm -hmm. refinance as often as you want. I'll give you a, first of all, what's the downside of doing that? Every mm -hmm. time you apply to, to re refinance, you get an inquiry on your credit. So if you mm -hmm. do it too often, it can actually lower your, your credit score. But I got a tip for you, okay? <laughs> what um, being someone who has lots of properties, I'm talking to banks probably w once a month about refinance options. What I do is I actually tell them, I actually don't want to refinance right now. I want you to tell me what the numbers would be if I refinanced. I tell them my credit score. So I will say my credit score is X. So I tell them don't run my credit score. If, if my credit score is this, what can you do for me? And they say, well, I can lower you a quarter of a point. Well, that may not be worth me doing mm -hmm. those things. So then I'll do something else. But, but what you want to do is, as you test the market, you tell them, do not run my credit score. Use this number. And then if you give me something that I want to use, then I'll let you run the score. I've been doing it for years and it works often because, you know, if, if, you, if you have your... And if you have too many inquiries, it will definitely lower your score. Okay, and the other part about that refinance, you continue to eat up the equity that's in your home. So the multiple refinances, so this time you added 2,000, they say, oh, we'll add the cost to the loan. Okay, and then this time it's 2,000, next time it's 3,000. And before you know it, you've added another six to 10,000 by multiple refinances. So yeah, you have to be careful with that as well. And, um, and, and don't get caught up into the whole um, process. Understand that refinancing is actually very simple. How mm -hmm. much does it cost me to do this and how much will I save every month? I'll give you an example here real, real quick. If it costs me a thousand bucks to re refinance and I asked my banker, I said, stop, don't give me all those little small details. What's the total cost? Because they, they'll tell you, well, your closing cost is this, your retention fee is that. I said, forget all that. What's the total cost? Okay, the total cost is, is $2,000. All right then, how much will you save me a month? I will save you 50 bucks a month. Okay, 50 bucks a month is $600 a year. 
all right, so if I pay 2000 to save 600 a year, that means in three and a half years, I'll get my money back. That, that, that's a good deal. All right. If I get, if it costs me $2,000 and I save 10 bucks a month, well, 10 bucks a month saves me 120 bucks a year. I'll be 15 years getting my money back. That's a bad deal. And my, and my point to you is that many times things seem complicated, but sit down and figure out the math on it. And you can very quickly figure out what's good or what's bad. If that's if that sounded complicated to you, catch me online. I'm telling you, catch me after the meeting. I'll explain it to you. Okay. And um, as markets has changed and went due to the COVID, there's also some upcoming changes as regards to the refinance. And now the additional fees, so you're going to need to either lock in that rate, uh, I think September 1st is Tuesday. Um, so let's take a look at this attachment, this video. And this is from the ABC News out of North Carolina. So where they talk about that adverse real estate market refinance fee. And thank you, Ms. Pat. I learned about this just the other day. So thanks so much for sharing that with me. Hey you. Yeah you. I opened a SoFi money account and it was the first time that I realized I can be earning interest back on my money. I just commercial. discovered SoFi and I'm an investor with a diversified portfolio. SoFi made it so there's no trade-off between my dreams and paying student loans. Thanks SoFi, Sofi for helping us get our money right. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a busy stretch for lenders like Justin Burris. Every lender has really taken on the refinance transaction just because it's, it's such high demand right now. With interest rates at half century lows, homeowners are taking advantage in an effort to save money. But that may not be the case for much longer. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have announced a new half percent adverse market fee beginning September 1st. The request approved by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. In a bulletin, Freddie Mac says it was due to risk management and forecast loss stemming from COVID-19. This is being passed on the consumer. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, that fee would cost the average consumer looking to refinance $1,400. In a statement, the MBA writes in part, quote, the additional 0.5% fee on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac refinance mortgages will raise costs for families trying to make ends meet in these challenging times. In addition, the September 1 effective date means that thousands of borrowers who did not lock in their rates could face unanticipated cost increases just days from closing. But it is going to affect some of those folks that may have been on the fence trying to figure out if it made sense or not for them to refinance. They may decide that they want to hold off for now. Still, Burris believes it won't be enough to impact a homeowner's decision on whether or not they choose to list their home instead. We're still way down. Pre-pandemic rates were probably a half a point lower than where we were. This would be a one-time fee on refinancing only and would not affect those making a new purchase. I'm Michael Perchik, ABC 11, Eyewitness News. Got okay, thank you for that. Yeah, so that's something new uh, uh, thing that we have to face going forward with refinances, and they're saying it's due to the risk with the uh, COVID-19. So we got now, to, did, did, okay. did I hear correctly there? Is that mm -hmm. only for, for, for yeah. Freddie Mac? So I'm assuming that is not for conventional loans and things like that. that um, Freddie Mac and Fannie both have conventional loans. Yes, mm -hmm. they, they, they play in that market too. So yeah, so if you're wondering if you have a Freddie, a Freddie Mac, you can go to their website and put your address in and it'll tell, tell you whether you have a Fannie loan or a Freddie loan, then you know that for sure applies to you. But I'm thinking it's gonna probably be FHA as well. So probably anything that's government backed, so where they're having to pay out so much money to keep the economy going, this is a way to kind of maybe offset some of that. All right, so re, uh, refinance, uh, oops. Okay, we'll go back to the previous slide. Okay, just talk a little bit more about that uh, adverse uh, fee that's effective September 1st. So um, you you want to go ahead and, you know, read that when you can, and then that video clip is at the bottom. Okay, next slide. Okay, there are also some scammers out there. We talked last time about spams and scams, and even with 
refinancing right now there are people calling people don't don't entertain them uh, but they know a lot of people are in distress right now so if you have any questions about your mortgage or your loan on your home be sure to contact your lender because right now they have a lot of people that are scamming and want to get your information and want you to think that they're helping you in reality they're gaining your information to use against you so just be aware that that's out there one very easy way to avoid those scams is when someone calls you and says, I'm, I'm from you know, Fifth Third Bank, you just say, okay, I'm tied up right now and I'll call you back. And that way you can call them because mm -hmm. people, people can spoof uh, phone numbers and you'll be speaking to someone somewhere else. So it's always Not a good right idea there. to get information and call them back. That way they mm -hmm. you know you're calling the bank. Very yeah, good. I like that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I got a call the other day from somebody in Florida talking about wanting to buy my house. Yes, yes. Be, be, be careful with, with that. And again, feel free to ask questions. So many of us, we, we get into that mode of, you know, I know everything and, I, you know, I'm comfortable making this decision. Get help because, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. Large companies are getting scammed also because employees think, think they know what's going on there. These scammers are very good. Mm -hmm. and, yes, and they please, are. Please don't, don't think you, you know, can, can win. They are trained and they are focused. Right. Yes, I got a call yesterday from Amazon about my order, you know, and said, we'll call this number. And I'm like, okay, I didn't order anything. And uh, indeed, I called the number for Amazon that I have. They said, oh, no, do not give them any information about anything on your Amazon account because their scammers are even, you know, out for information. And I guess right now where we're, times are so hard and so difficult for so many, and don't be sold in on it just because you may be in a challenge and thinking that somebody that's really out there to help you, definitely check things out. One quick thing, and I know we're short on time. My grandfather had a saying that I use to this day. He, he used to always say, let's wait for the common sense of morning. <laughs> and I always loved that saying because uh, one easy way to know a scammer is that for some reason, they try to get you to do it right then. It's always right now. This, this, this mm -hmm. deal is happening right now. You have to do it because they want you to use your emotion. You know, if you don't do it right now, <laughs> It goes away. Mm -hmm. Again, wait for the common sense of morning. Hey, let me think about it. I'll call you in the morning. If it goes away today, so be it. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's that's good. Good, good point. Good wisdom. All right. So we'll just take about maybe a couple of more minutes, and I know everybody has a lot to do. So we'll we'll go to the next slide, and we can pick up to on our next session um, if others want to. Uh, go forward, but we'll go ahead with a couple more slides and we'll kind of see how things go. And if you have to leave, we understand. So, but everything will be accessible online, but I do want to cover uh, this other key uh, bit of information. And this is about the reverse mortgage. Now, reverse mortgage is a mortgage that you currently have and it's aimed for people who are 62 years of age or older. And so that reverse mortgage, you will get a call, like many of the other calls we get, like we want you to consider this reverse mortgage. And um, so that means that what, in a nutshell, they want you to consider is stopping any payments that you're paying right now on that mortgage, and they can set up some alternate things for you to start drawing from the equity that's in your home. Okay, so they're going to take your current mortgage. Now I'm 62 and I can't make my payments. You know, or I want to do some traveling or for whatever reason, people are taking money out. So it can be a good thing for the right time and the right situation, whether it's like medical related or uh, surgery or something someone may have to have. And so this slide here uh, just kind of tells you, let me go down here to... Um, the second bullet, with a reverse mortgage loan, homeowners are required to pay property taxes. You still pay your taxes and your homeowners, but you're using the equity to get those payments out. Uh, a reverse mortgage 
converts the equity in your home into cash. You can receive it as large sums all at once. You can establish a line of credit to draw on it as you please, or you can get paid in monthly installments. So this can be a powerful tool at the right time for the right situation. So if you wish, you can pay it back the same as you would any other loan. Uh, you could just not pay it back. And then when you no longer reside in that property, then that's when the payments are going to be required and be to be paid. So it, it has some risk in it, especially if you want to leave your home to your children and things like that. But if you are wanting it for medical reasons and some other reasons would be good. So let's go ahead to this next bullet. Am I eligible for this reverse mortgage? You must be age 62 or older. I'm sorry, go back. Uh -huh. And uh, you must own your primary property and you must be currently living in it. And if you have a, have a, must have an outstanding mortgage on that house, and it should be a small amount relative to the home's value, so less than 50%. You would still be required to pay property taxes and insurance. So this <clears throat> home equity conversion mortgage is most uh, type of mortgage that you would get when you're drawing out that money. So with this reverse mortgage loan, the amount the homeowner own, owes to the lender goes up and not down over time. Okay, so you have to understand you stopped your payment, now they're paying you money. So those payments that you were accruing but not been paid, that doesn't go away. So there's fees associated with doing this as well. So this is because interest and fees are added to the loan balance each month. As your loan balance increases, your home equity decreases. So a reverse, a reverse mortgage loan is not free money it is a loan where the borrower money plus the interest plus the fees each month equals the rising loan balance so the homeowner or other heirs will eventually have to pay back the loan using you know usually by selling that house so it could be a good thing depending on health conditions um, medical needs or other living requirements that somebody may not have to uh, sustain so next slide Real quick on that, I think mm -hmm. this is an outstanding idea uh, if, if used properly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also, though, an idea that with the wrong company, those fees mm -hmm. would eat you alive there. So, so again, doing your homework is important. Also, scammers use this process, too. <laughs> so, again, the idea of a, of a reverse mortgage is a good idea if, if it fits you. But understand that having the right company, fees, is going to be important and also making sure it's a real company scammers is going to be important also okay so again kind of recap um when do i have to pay back the you know the mortgage okay so reverse mortgage loans typically must be repaid either when you move out of the home or when you die however the loan may need to be paid back sooner if the home is no longer your primary residence and uh, if you fail to pay your property taxes or your homeowner's insurance. And we'll just talk quickly at, at so many people, many who get older in age, or even they have paid off their homes, they forget to maybe pay that property taxes. Uh, that's something that we need to help make sure our elderly family members and church members as well, because your home can end up at the corner at the county clerk's office to be sold just because you failed to pay those property taxes. So that's key here too as well, because if you fail to pay those taxes, even though you're not paying your mortgages anymore, so you just think everything is going well, but then you forgot, oh, I need to continue that homeowner's insurance and I need to continue that property taxes. Even though I'm not paying a mortgage, I still have that responsibility. So most reverse mortgage loans are home equity conversion. So we talked about that. So this is when it normally pays off when you die or when you sell your home or you no longer live in it. So an eligible non-borrowing spouse is a um, term used for your spouse when he or she is not a co-borrower but qualifies under the U.S. Department of Housing. So if you are married and you have a non-borrowing spouse, <clears throat> they can continue to stay until they, uh, after you have died. All right, next slide. Um, let's say more on the reverse mortgage. So, and then I guess now on the third bullet here, the money received by the borrower is compounded at a monthly interest rate 
of approximately 1%. So in a 10 year period, this would mean that the borrower receives approximately $36,000 in total, while the end and balance owed totals close to $70,000, which means that the borrower is paying almost double the amount that she is receiving. So it, it, it is, it is good, but also just keep in mind the cost and that things will have to be paid back. And the next slide. All right, um, we'll, we'll pass this one for now. And it's just kind of an overview of reverse mortgage. So other housing options. So this is the one I kind of wanted to maybe spend just about five minutes on real quickly. So you can see um, some other things. You can move in with your kids, housing, house sharing. You can independent living com communities, assisted living, life plan communities. There's a lot of ways that in retirement, what do I do? What are my options as I'm aging? Don't want that full responsibility of a home and what am I gonna be faced with? So the next slide. Will I qualify for skilled nursing care? So this one is really important because oftentimes we don't know the future of our health and understanding there's a, almost a whole law degree that you can get on understanding that uh, Medicaid and that skilled nursing care and what my options are gonna be. So depending upon the state in which you reside, so in 2017, the daily costs associated with the skilled nursing care swung uh, widely between 140 to $771 per day. So for a semi-private room, you know, you can get it for 165 to 771 per day. So that's making the cost of nursing home, as you can see, if you do the math, very, very expensive, seven, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month on the low end. You know, and then it's gonna depend on the property, the state you're living in, and things like that. So I do want us to click on that first uh, first slide if we could and open that one up. Uh, the first link there. As an elder care attorney, I find that the five-year look-back rule is one of the most confusing and misunderstood concepts with respect to Medicaid planning. Too many people erroneously believe that you cannot plan for Medicaid if you don't have at least five years. This video will explain why that is absolutely not true. In fact, the vast majority of my clients come to me wanting Medicaid now or next month not in five years. First, let me explain what exactly is the Medicaid five-year look-back period. When one applies to Medicaid's institutional care or Medicaid waiver programs, the file will be assigned to a Medicaid caseworker at the Department of Children and Families in Florida. The Medicaid caseworker may review all transactions for the prior five years to determine whether any assets, including money, stocks, property, anything, were given away to any individual or entity for less than fair market value. They also commonly refer to that as a gift. This review by the Medicaid caseworker is referred to as the look-back period. If the caseworker finds transfers for less than fair market value or outright gifts within the five-year period before the date the application is actually submitted, a penalty period will be assessed. The purpose of the Medicaid penalty period is to dissuade Medicaid applicants from giving away their assets for the sole purpose of qualifying for Medicaid. Because during the penalty period, Medicaid will not pay for long-term care. In the notes below, I will link to an article that further explains how the Medicaid look-back period is calculated. The bottom line is, Medicaid law only penalizes you for giving away assets in the last five years. However, your elder care attorney won't advise you to give away assets. Instead, we will advise you on how to protect those assets in a Medicaid-compliant manner that does not trigger the Medicaid look-back period. This will allow you to protect your hard-earned assets. I hope this video has cleared up some confusion about the Medicaid five-year look-back rule. To learn more, please go to elderneedslaw.com and schedule a consultation. 
So I wanted to kind of show that because as, as we're aging and oftentimes we may have to go into skilled nursing facilities, there's always that question, will I qualify? Will I be eligible for nursing care assistance? And uh, that five year look back is really important. And then we got one more that we'll take a look at. And then we will. Yeah, I want to say that. quickly while we're doing that and I, mm -hmm. I won't bore you with, with a long statement there, that was a very important video. You need to ask about that one because mm -hmm. I get so many people. I would love to talk to you more about it, but we're short on time, but that was extremely important. Please know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this may not impact you right now, but you may have friends, family members, or neighbors, church members that you can yeah. help out. Well, if, 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 you're, if you're anywhere near 60, know this, because mm -hmm. it's extremely important. Which I, I wish I could say more. <laughs> right. So there's some confusion over the five-year rule for Medicaid. It's also referred to as the Medicaid five-year look-back period. A lot of people don't know what it is and they're a little bit confused by it. So that's what this video is going to address. So what we know is that you need $2,000 or less in total assets in order to qualify for Medicaid. And most people have more than that. And what a lot of people decide that they're gonna do is they think that they can engage in their own Medicaid planning without hiring an attorney. And they say, well, I'm going to just give all my money to my child and then I'll qualify for Medicaid. I'll have my nursing home paid for. And I think that's how it works. Well, Medicaid, the agency, recognizes that people are going to try to do this. And what they have since done is they've imposed a penalty. And here's how that works. When you're applying for Medicaid, it will be assigned to an agent or an investigator, and they will look at your banking transactions and any significant transactions. And you, and you also have to swear under penalties of perjury um, that you have not made any gifts over the past 10 years. That's a transfer of money or property without commensurate value. So if Medicaid conducts their investigation and they see some checks written to your child four years ago, well, they're going to look into that. And if there's not a satisfactory answer as to why you gave your child money, uh, they're going to impose a penalty. And the penalty is the average cost of a nursing home in the state of Florida. Uh, this is the penalty divisor. And currently that's uh, $8,662. But um, so I can illustrate how this works. Let's say it's $8,000. The penalty divisor is $8,000. They're going to take the total amount of money that you've gifted over the past five years and they're going to divide that amount by the penalty divisor, and then the result will be the number of months that you will be excluded from Medicaid, that Medicaid will refuse to pay for your long-term care. So again, let's say that before you apply for Medicaid, four years ago, let's say you gave $80,000, you gifted $80,000 to one of your children, and then you applied for Medicaid. And the Medicaid investigator found out about this um, assuming the penalty divisor was $8,000, you take $80,000, that's the gift, they divide it by the penalty divisor, and that's in our hypothetical example, $8,000, and then you would not be able, be eligible for Medicaid for the following 10 months. It's from the date you are in the nursing home and would otherwise qualify for Medicaid, which is very, very important. Another important thing to note is there is no limit to the number of months that you can be disqualified from Medicaid. It can exceed five years. If you transferred a sufficient amount of money, um, the penalty period can be as long as it needs to be. So this is why it's very, very important not to engage in amateur Medicaid planning. Take the time, it'll be well worth it to sit down with an elder law attorney or a Medicaid attorney to walk you through what you ought to be doing so you can avoid the Medicaid penalty in their five-year gift uh, look back period. Hey, I, I want to quickly speak on that. And, and again, that is so important. Let me give you just a quick stat so you guys will know it. I'm sorry for taking time for this, but it's, it's important. 
one one negative things for African Americans already is that the average African American family has only six tenths of the income of the average white family. This isn't a race thing, but if you, if you make make it a point here. But sadly, uh, the average African American family only has one tenth of the wealth that a white family has. It's even so, not only is six tenths of the income bad enough but one-tenth of the wealth. The reason why is because of real estate, okay? And and this thing that you hear about right now, uh, about how homes are lost because of this look-back rule is so important. Real quick, getting personal here, I don't own my home. I don't own the truck I drive. Miss Lisa, I don't, we don't own the, the, the vehicle Miss Lisa drives. I don't own any real estate. Uh, I've set things up through an attorney. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not pushing myself here, but I know these rules work. Understand that so many African-American families are losing all kinds of wealth because of this rule, okay? There, there are ways that you, you, you can actually give wealth to your children and protect things legally. And this is what Miss Bev is talking about here. It's it's real. If you see me want to talk about that, please let's let's you know let's let's talk about those things. But understand there are ways to protect your wealth and mm -hmm. still get Medicare. I, I'm I'm 58, and I'm doing it already. Is the point? Very good. Very good points. And again, that education is so so key at different stages of our lives and, and things happen so quickly. So planning, planning, planning is so important. And the only other slide I had had to do with long-term care insurance because oftentimes we, we think in terms of, okay, I, I, I can't afford the Medicaid uh, in order to get into the nursing home. You know, so sometimes people are having to stay in their homes and maybe be able to get nursing assistants and people to come into the home to care for them, to bathe them. And the good and the bad of that, that's another insurance tool that the insurance company provides. So if you take this out of age 50 and you don't need it until you're age 70, and then you look at, okay, I'm paying $150 a month for my long-term care just in case I don't qualify for that nursing home and have to stay in my own home. So now I've paid 150 times 12 times 20 years. Oh boy, I paid a lot, a lot of money. Uh, sometimes it's a good tool. Like again, with everything that we always talk about, it could be the right tool for the right person at the right time. But be careful, even in that, you know, because they're taking your money, they're investing, and they're using it. And by the time I'm 70, 75. You know, again, that may be something that I may never take any use of. Should I have put that money into some investment and grown that money and had that pool of money available for my, you know, long-term care in the event that I needed some services that I didn't have money for? So there's a lot of information out there for us as consumers. So our big thing is that you you read, that you educate yourself on all things that is going to be pertinent to your situation. Uh, don't always take everybody's advice. Do your own educating yourself and being able to, you know, research, call attorneys, get partners now before you really need them. I, I like how he meets with his uh, important people every quarter and buy them lunch. Hey, I, I think I would steal that because information, information is so important in, ter in terms of making great decision makers uh, for your finances. So. Anybody have any other questions? I know we ran over, but um, just wanted to be able to share some housing things because we're in different places at different times. Some are buying, some are retiring. Um, and we just have to not just think, okay, I don't need to deal with these things. These things are important because you're going to have to make decisions throughout mm -hmm. your life. Any questions, any feedback, anything that we can answer before we log off? You know, I'm I'm going to ask you, Miss Bev, to con to consider um, maybe next month going over reverse mortgages and long-term care, estate planning, and those kind of things. Again, we kind of put that at the very end here. And as someone who is there, and I think most of the folks in this audience are there, those are some very important topics. And 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 I think I can't speak for the group, but I find myself 
kind of speak and talk in code because there's so much, 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 uh, many things there. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking that even the example I gave may have not been clear enough. When I said I don't own my home, <laughs> what I'm saying is that I've spoken to an attorney. I've put the, mm -hmm. I've, I've done estate planning. So now, even though we live in our home, we drive our cars on paper, we don't own those things. And we've done, we did that specifically for estate planning, specifically so we can uh, qualify for Medicaid and all those things there. And th that is an entire process and mm -hmm. if we don't understand that, what's going to happen is that someone's going to come in and say, before you qualify for these things, you got to sell your house. And, and so if we mm -hmm. can, let's go back and sure. look at this next month because that is, that's too important a topic to spend the last 15 minutes on because there's so many things there. Okay, that sounds like I a great, mm -hmm. great, great idea. Yeah, good. trying to cover everything, is, it can be kind of challenging. So good point and uh, share the information with people, invite other people to come along next time just so that we share that information and that we become knowledgeable what things we can do. And um, so we, we will definitely do that on our next session. All right, any other feedback questions? Anything else this morning? Uh, almost afternoon. I really appreciate y'all taking time to come. I hope it's been beneficial in some small way, but you can have access to me and to Deacon Moore if you have other questions along the way. We will post this, and then it will be out on YouTube, maybe in about a week or so as well. We'll post, post it on our church's website, Main mm -hmm. Street Baptist Church. So, say you have a question? Keisha. Keisha, okay, Keisha, go ahead. All right, we're near each other, so I turned my volume down. If, if, if you can have the, the yeah, person who, who, is, who is not talking to, to, to mute theirs. Okay. Okay. It's better. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say I'm, I'm on the investment side. We can't hear you. We're good. Let me just see you. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we just turned mine all the way down then. So hopefully it's better. So my question, um, I'm kind of on the investment side. So I own the property that I'm in. I have another property that I own and I'm wanting to invest in more properties. So um, that's kind of where I would need some assistance with. So i um, very interested in taking you to lunch, Mr. Moore. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Don't don't mind that that at all. Yes, and I was gonna I was gonna say to you, let's take that offline because right. that's a conversation. But but yes, um, I actually mentor about twelve people, and uh, we do this all all the time. There's, I'd be happy to to speak w with you. But but love, I I can't tell how old you are, but I can tell you're not an, an, as old as I am. <laughs> I think it's outstanding that you're actually looking to invest now. I've been doing this since I was 24 years old. My sons do it. It's, it's the best thing going. Let's have lunch. I would love to have lunch. So I will get your information from Cecilia. I feel like God always knows, and it's crazy because this is what I've been working on, praying about. And then Cecilia reached out and said, hey, why don't you jump on this thing with me? And I, the whole time I just kept saying, all right, God, I hear you. <laughs> so... <laughs> Absolutely. I, I will, again, we'll speak more offline, but I'll tell the group. There's a, a quick story here. I, I actually had desired to, to write down things that I have done myself in, in a book uh, for, for my sons. Not, not a book to publish, but one just to give my sons. But I read a book. It's called The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. It's a blue book. It's by Gary Keller, the millionaire real estate in investor. When I read that book, I said to myself, I don't have to write a book. This guy wrote down my process. It's amazing how so many people are using the exact process. But if you want to know what's going on, the millionaire real estate investor by Gary Keller is an outstanding book for, for anyone who wants to know. I, I tell people, I love, I love to tell you how smart I am, but I'm really not. What I do is I follow the same process every time. Investing should be boring. It should be automatic. And if you do it the correct way, and that book tells you how to do it, it's very easy. Thank you so much. 
Awesome. And, and 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 by the way, at some point in the future, if we if you want to do a session on that, don't mind do, doing that 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 one also. But that, that's a great book. All right, very good. Any other feedback, comments, or anybody else have anything before we end? Really appreciate y'all coming in this morning and spending time with us. So if you have any other questions, just let us know, and we'll be here to assist as we can. Thank you all very much, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye. God bless. God bless you. Bye.